since they'll help us understand states in the non-unital case. So they'll be uh, useful there. Um, so what is an approximate identity? So here we have a, a Banach algebra, say. So then uh, a net of elements, say a lambda and a is a left uh, approximate identity. If uh, we'll want them to be uniformly bounded, so the soup over lambda and lambda of a lambda's finite. And uh, if we act on the left, um, then, uh, yeah, so if we act on the left, then it should approximate, appro uh, give us an identity in the limit. So x minus a lambda x should go to zero as lambda goes to infinity um, for all x and a. So of course, if a has a unit, then the constant uh, function, which is a unit, uh, certainly satisfies this. All right, so this is going to be more, interested, uh, more interesting for us in non-unital uh, Bonnach algebras and C-star algebras. All right, um, so we're mostly going to be interested in C-star algebras. Uh, so note if A is a C-star algebra, then we can interchange, so we, we have, analogously, we have the notion of a right approximate identity by just requiring instead that if we act on the right, then this goes to zero. Um, and if we have a C-star algebra, then there's a way to go between left and right pretty easily, and that's by taking adjoint. So if A is a C-star algebra, so uh, then a lambda, lambda is a left approximate identity if and only if it's adjoint a lambda star lambda is a right approximate identity. Um, so we can go between left and right in a C star algebra just by taking adjoints. In particular, if the A lambdas happen to be, uh, say, self-adjoint, then it's both a left and right approximate identity at the same time. Uh, the main result we'll want here is that for C-star algebras, they always have approximate identities. Uh, so this is a useful uh, thing to remember. So we'll prove this in a bit more generality. So the proposition, so if, if A is a C star algebra, and I inside of A is a left ideal. So then I will have a right approximate identity consisting of positive elements. Uh, so then there exists uh, a net an increasing net so this is going to be contained in the positive cone but also contained in the left ideal um, and this is such that uh, whenever we have uh, x and the ideal, then, well, it's a right approximate identity. So x a lambda minus x goes to zero as lambda goes to one. Yeah. Uh, the condition that supremum of the norm of a uh, lambda is less than infinity, isn't that like implied by uh, second condition? Uh, is it? 
I don't think necessarily, but I'm fine if it is. Okay. Um, all right. So this is the proposition that we want to show. Uh, so probably in a C star algebra it is. If we think about that for a moment, maybe that's the case. If A is unit all, of course, if A has a unit, then that's obviously true. But uh, how about uh, if we did something silly like take a Banach space and define the product of any two elements to be zero? Oh, it won't be an approximate identity in that case. Okay, I don't know. You can try to prove that during the lecture. Uh, for me, it's not not so important. Uh, but no, 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 no. Um, no, no, of course. Already in the abelian C star algebra setting, uh, that's not going to be necessarily true. Uh, so, for example. Um, you can consider, so these are where approximate identities, of course, come from. So uh, an example is let's consider uh, A to be continuous functions which vanish at infinity on some x, x here, locally compact uh, Hausdorff. And let's consider I to be the continuous functions with compact support. So this is the uh, set of continuous functions uh, with compact support. So this is an ideal in the C star algebra. Well, the proposition says that there'll be an increasing sequence of uh, elements here, uh, which are approximate identity. Um, uh, but but to uh, answer your question, you could have, so since they're increasing, they will of course be bounded. Uh, so that's no problem. But you could imagine if our x is the real line, you could imagine taking, so here's one, you could imagine taking a sequence of functions that were, you know, so this is what you think of when you think of approximate identity, something like this. But you could also imagine thinking of something that goes really high and then comes down, and then something else which goes really high over here and then comes down, and the bump which goes to infinity gets pushed to infinity. So this would certainly give an approximate identity for this ideal and even this, um, but uh, well, for this, probably you can do it in a way for approximate identity for this, but the norm would be going to infinity. I'm sure you can cook up something like this. Uh, so no, I don't think this condition is automatic. Um, yeah. But in our case, uh, they'll be even bounded by one and they'll be increasing uh, for the proposition. So let's prove this proposition. And, and this should be the picture you have in mind because of course, C star algebras are non-commutative. Uh, you know, this is the commutative example so we should think of these sorts of functions which are kind of one at a large point and then they go down to zero and these are what we should have in mind for our approximate identity. All right, so let's go ahead and prove this. And so we can try to mimic the proof in the commutative case where we can just draw a picture there. Um, but of course, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, a quite a bit more subtle in the non-commutative case because we, we don't have points to work with. We can't draw pictures necessarily. Uh, but here's the idea. Uh, so let's let lambda uh, denote the set of finite subsets of A, this is going to be our net, so this is ordered by inclusion, ordered by inclusion. So that's our directed set. So for each finite subset, I want to produce uh, this positive element A lambda, and that's easy enough to do. So if 
we take an element of lambda, so this is a finite subset. Let's just set h sub lambda to be the sum over all x and lambda of x star x. Uh, so this uh, i is, oh, so these are sets of finite subsets of i. Uh, ordered by inclusion. So this now, since x is an i and i is a left ideal, so this is contained in i. So this is contained in i, and it's also a positive element. Uh, but of course, this is not going to be a very good approximate identity. This, you know, is huge. Uh, so we do what we would do if we were in the commutative section. So we use functional calculus here to kind of make it. Uh, you know, bounded by one. So specifically what we do is we set a lambda to be... I don't understand what the, so summation of x is lambda or... So lambda is a finite subset of i. So we oh. take all the elements in i and we take x star x and then we add them up. Yeah. Uh, and now, so this, you know, we're adding up a bunch of things in i, so this maybe have very large norm. Uh, but now we temper it by some function to, to make it, um, you know, much nicer. So specifically what we can do is we can take um, the size of lambda times h lambda and then 1 plus the size of lambda h lambda inverse. Of course, h lambda is a positive operator, so 1 plus h lambda is invertible, right? So we can take its inverse, uh, and by functional calculus, this will be a positive uh, element. Right? So this is also a uh, positive element. Moreover, since h lambda is an i, of course, here we could put this on the left or the right because it's we're using functional calculus; it's commutative, uh, and so they, this, this is also an i. So this is, and I claim that this is the approximate identity we're looking for. Uh, so first, let's show that it is an increasing net. And then we'll show that it gives an approximate identity. All right. So note, we can maybe write this a little bit nicer to, to show that it's increasing. If we had just one h lambda, so we can just rewrite this as one minus, uh, you just do a computation here. Uh, those should be the same things. Let's see, if we put this inside, then we get that, and then uh, multiply across terms, that checks out. Right. So, all right, so this is equal to this. And how is that useful? Well, this only has one h lambda, so we can use it to show that it's uh, an increasing sequence. So indeed, if, if lambda is contained in some lambda prime, so then what do we know? Well, certainly the h lambdas, we're just adding more stuff. So therefore, we get that then h, h lambda is less than or equal to h lambda prime because we're just adding more stuff onto it. Uh, but what does that mean? So that means that if we take 1 over lambda plus h lambda, remember if we do inverses, then that reverses this. So we get, therefore, 1 over uh, lambda prime plus h lambda prime uh, inverse. Well, uh, this is less than or equal to 1 over the size of lambda plus h lambda inverse, because this should be less than or equal to this. I guess the only thing is here, uh, we need the less than or equal to one over. Yeah, now I think it's correct, right? Because if you multiply this through, what are we saying? Well, this is less than or equal to this which of course implies that the size of lambda times h lambda is less than or equal to the size of lambda times h lambda prime, which is less than or equal to, which then 
uh, adding, uh, well, then adding one and taking the inverses give this an equal. Okay? So if we have this as less than or equal to this, therefore one minus this is less than or equal to one minus this. So that implies therefore that a lambda prime is less than, or a lambda is less than or equal to a lambda prime. Mm -hmm. So this is an increasing net. Is that okay? All right, so this is an increasing net, and now the only thing we have left to show is that uh, the a lambdas form a right approximate identity. Uh, so to do that, let's just compute. So if we have x and i, um, so, uh, yeah, and if x is in some lambda, so let's take, we'll look at those lambdas which contain x. So then what can we say? So then what I want to compute is I want to compute the norm of x uh, a lambda minus x. And I want to say that this is not too big. Uh, so to compute the norm of something, we'll use the C-star algebra identity and say that this is equal Let's compute the norm squared. So this is equal to the norm of x a lambda minus x star, and then x a lambda minus x. The reason I do that is that I'll get an x star x, which is good for h lambda. Uh, so what do we say? C, we see that this is then equal to, we distribute this, uh, we, distribute this out, and then we're going to get uh, this computation. Oh, we, I don't even want to distribute it out. So this is less than or equal to, so this is a positive operator. So, and we have an x here. Uh, so again, if we just add more stuff to it, it's only going to get larger. And the norm, therefore the norm only get larger. So this is less than or equal to, and now sum overall uh, y and lambda, I guess we fixed x, so y a lambda minus y, y a lambda minus y. So that's no problem there. And now this should look just like we have some y star y's. Uh, Y, yes, thank you. So Y is in little lambda, and then we should be yes, and I claim that this is equal to um, I'm trying to do this without write, writing the identity down anywhere because. Uh, um, uh, which inequality? Well, this one, of course, uh, so I'm adding the positive elements, and x is one of them. So this element in the C star algebra is larger than this element, so therefore its norm is larger than this. Norm. So that's, that's how we get there. Um, and now I want to write. So if A were unital, may, maybe that's the trick I'll want to do. Uh, so let's, uh, that way I, I want to write the unit. So let's uh, embed A inside of its unitization. Okay. Then I can write, uh, then this looks a little bit nicer uh, because I can write this as, um, y times a lambda minus the identity. So this then becomes uh, 1 minus a lambda. 
And now we have the sum over y and y, so that's h lambda. And now here, uh, so that's here we have 1 minus a lambda again. It's OK. Right, when we take the adjoint, so when we take the adjoint, we're going to get an a lambda here. We're going to get y. Y is going to be in the middle. So we sum over the y star y. That gives us h lambda. We have 1 minus a lambda over here. Uh, so this is then equal to that. Um, so having it in the unitization allows me to write the 1, but notice that, of course, the h lambda is an i, so this is all an i, which is not in the unitization. Right? Um, uh, and in fact, what is this element here? Uh, so uh, there's our definition of a lambda right there. So 1 minus a lambda is just this thing right here. So this is just, um, what, uh, um, we're going to have 1 over size of lambda, uh, 1 over size of lambda plus h lambda. And this is going to be squared, squared, and then h lambda. OK. So h lambda, of course, commutes with the a lambdas and everything here. Uh, so now what do we have? We have this. Uh, so now this is just, right, this is just uh, f of h lambda, where Uh, oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so this is just f of h lambda, where f of t is the function 1 over size of lambda squared. Uh, and then we have 1 over size of lambda squared plus t squared uh, times minus and then another t here. All right, so we're just taking this function and we're applying it to h lambda. But then uh, the thing to notice about this function, so here we have a, you know, square t on the, in the denominator. Here we have a, a linear on the numerator. So this function vanishes at infinity, and, and it's non-negative, and we can compute its maximum quite easily. Right? And in fact, the maximum, you can uh, use your favorite calculus trick or whatever, but the maximum is going to be contained exactly when t is equal to, um, I think, 2 times the size of lambda or something. I wrote it down before. Uh, so this, the claim is that this function is less than or equal to 1 over 4 size of lambda. So, um, Yeah, you can check this pretty easily, right? This is just baby calculus. Uh, okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means that if we apply f to any positive operator, then the spectrum is going to be contained in the interval from, from 0 to this number, which means, of course, the norm is going to be dominated by this. So we get that the norm of this is dominated by 1 over 4 times the size of lambda. In particular, as the sets get larger and larger, this goes to zero. All right, so that shows that it's an approximate identity. Um, how do you know that h lambda has norm 1? How do we know that h lambda has norm 1? Uh, that's because, of course, that we don't know that h lambda has norm 1. In fact, it may be very large, but uh, we should remark that the norm of a lambda is less than or equal to 1 for the same functional calculus reasoning there. That the range, if you put in t here instead of h lambda, then the range of this function is dominated by 1. Yeah. All right, any other questions about that? So any, so as a corollary, of course, is that uh, any C star algebra has 
a, a both simultaneously left and right approximate identity because these are positive elements, so it'll be both left and right. Uh, so uh, if a is a C star algebra, then uh, a has an approximate identity consisting of increasing positive operators. Indeed, just take A to be the ideal sitting inside itself. Um, another corollary uh, is that This is the corollary I want to say. Yeah, another corollary is that if I inside of A is a closed two sided ideal, so then I is a C star algebra. So any closed two-sided ideal in a C-star algebra is again a C-star algebra, right? So why is this? So let's give a little proof of this. Of course, the fact that it's a, it's clearly a Banach space that's closed, uh, it's also closed under multiplication, so it'll be a Banach algebra. The only question is, is it closed under taking adjoints? That's what we have to find out. Right? But notice that uh, it's a two-sided ideal, so in particular it's a left ideal, so we can use the previous proposition. So I have proof, put the proof right here. Um, let's take, say, the A lambdas as in the proposition. So this increasing approximate unit for I. And then the thing to notice is if X is in I, so then we have that x a lambda converges to x. Uh, so we get the therefore, taking adjoints, we get the a lambda x star converges to x. And it's a two-sided ideal, and a lambda is in the ideal, so therefore this is in i, x star. And it's closed, so therefore the limit's also in i. Okay? So therefore this uh, is closed under taking adjoints, and we get a c star sub sub algebra. Uh, another corollary is that not only are ideals closed ideals, two-sided ideals, C star algebras, but also the quotients are C star algebras. So a a C star algebra, I and a a closed two-sided ideal. So then the quotient is a C star algebra. Um, so here the quotient, so we already know that I is closed under taking adjoint. So therefore the adjoint uh, structure can gives you an isometry on the quotient. Um, so here the, the tricky thing is not to show that it's, you know, has a nice adjoint. The tricky thing is to show that it's a Banach algebra, that it's actually, um, you know, the product of two things, that the norm of the product is less than or equal to the product of the norms. Um, but however this is the case, because what is the norm? So if we have an element in X, what is the norm and the quotients? It's exactly the distance from x to the ideal, um, but I claim that that can be checked by using the approximate identity. Uh, so the claim is that the norm of the quotient is the limit as lambda goes to infinity of uh, 
x minus x a lambda, where a lambda is the approximate identity coming from the proposition. Uh, so one, so in particular the limit exists. So one inequality is clear because this is defined to be the distance which is the infimum of all such things. So therefore uh, the infimum is certainly less than or equal so this inequality is obvious or if you put lim soup there so this part is obvious. It's the other inequality that's maybe not so obvious uh, so to do that uh, we'll fix epsilon greater than zero. By definition of the norm there exists something and there exists some b in i such that the norm of x in the quotient is, uh, so this is the infimum, so if we get very close to it, it should be greater than or equal to the norm of x minus b uh, minus epsilon. Right? Um, okay, so we have uh, this inequality, but now we know that b is in the ideal and we have an approximate unit for the ideal, and so now we can just say that um, uh, Is what limit zero? Uh, no, no, no. Of course, uh, x the a lambda, a lambda is an approximate unit for i, right? The a lambdas are an i, and x is not an i. Right? If x were an i, this would be zero, but this one would be zero, right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> right. So yeah, x ways a lambda, the approximate. Unit for i coming from the proposition. <clears throat> okay, so we get this, and now I claim that this should give us this. So therefore, yeah, so now if we look at x minus x a lambda uh, and the point is is that if we put a b here well b minus b a lambda is very close to zero so this is very very close to uh, x for a lambda large x minus b minus x minus b a lambda which now this is less than or equal to, so a lambda is less than or equal to one, but they're positive elements, so in the unitization, one minus a lambda is also less than or equal to one. So by viewing this in the unitization, this is less than or equal to x minus b times the norm of one minus a lambda. And in the unitization, this is a contraction, so this is less than or equal to x minus b which we already know up here is less than or equal to the norm of x a mod lambda and a mod i plus epsilon. Mm -hmm. And this was true for all epsilon, right? So if we take the limit as lambda goes to infinity, we get the other inequality. Uh, but now we can see that it's a Banach algebra and we get the C-star algebra identity quite easily uh, because just note that if we have x star x a mod lambda, or a mod i, that this is equal to the limit as lambda goes to infinity. Here we could have also put a lambda on the other side for the same reason. Um, uh, and this is the limit as lambda goes to infinity. And here we could put um, x minus x a lambda star x minus x a lambda
But now we're in a C star algebra. This is a C star norm. So this is the limit as lambda goes to infinity of x minus x a lambda squared, which is the norm of x and a mod i squared. Yeah. OK. Uh, so then we get the C star algebra identity and the Banach algebra identity, Banach space. There's the same. So maybe it's been fairly abstract for this lecture. So let's maybe take a break and look at examples. So, so far we don't have very many examples, uh, but one nice example we have is the commutative example. X, a locally compact house door space. Uh, so then, if we have, say, a closed subset, F and X, a closed subset. Oh, by the way, I should maybe mention one quick remark about this proposition is, uh, so we took nets, and indeed if you have some monstrous non-separable C-star algebras, you're going to need nets in general. But if you like to work with sequences, uh, of course, um, if we just took any dense subset of I and let a lambda be finite subsets there, that's fine. In particular, if I is separable, which is the case of A is separable, uh, then, uh, then we could take a countable collection here, and hence we get a sequence. Um, so as long as A is separable, then you can take a sequence uh, in this case rather than a net. That's just a remark. All right. But in general, you you need a net even in the abelian situation. Yeah. All right, so let's take a C star algebra. There's a locally comp continuous functions on a locally compact Hausdorff house space, which vanish at infinity. And we take a closed subset. So then we can set uh, I to be the set of functions uh, such that F restricted to the closed subset F uh, vanishes. And then this is a perfectly nice closed ideal in A. So then I is a closed ideal. All right, well then by what we've seen, I is a C star algebra and A mod I is a C star algebra. These are both abelian C star algebras. So we know that they're continuous functions on some uh, locally compact space, so we should be able to identify that. Uh, and indeed, it's not so difficult to do. Uh, you can just see um, that I, as a C-star algebra, is just isomorphic to continuous functions on the complement of I, which vanish at infinity, so this is an open set. Uh, and the isomorphism, so uh, I sits inside of A, and how, under this isomorphism, how does this sit inside of this? Well, if you take a function on this open set, which vanishes at its at infinity, so then you can extend it to a continuous function on the whole thing by just setting it to be zero on F. Uh, so we have a natural isomorphism here. Uh, and on the other hand, we have a natural isomorphism also so let's try to identify the quotient space. So I claim that the quotient space is going to be continuous functions vanishing at infinity on F. Uh, so if F is compact, of course, it's all continuous functions. Uh, so why is this the case? Um, uh, let's see, what is the isomorphism going from here to here? Uh, so if you have a continuous function on f, which vanishes at infinity, then we know by Eurozone's lemma, it can extend to some continuous function on the whole space, and then we view it as an element in here. Right? And that gives you a map from here to here. Uh, conversely, if you have something here, 
So then it has some representation as a function in A, and you just take that function and restrict it to F, and that gives you a function here. So the go from here to here is just a restriction map. Uh, so this is kind of what's going on. So ideals are analogous to closed or open sets, depending on your perspective. So ideals, so we should think this, this should be the intuition that in a general C star algebra, ideals are somehow non-commutative closed sets or something like this. Uh, in fact, this is the generic situation. If a is abelian, then we know that it's C0 of x for some locally compact Hausdorff space. And uh, in fact, uh, every closed ideal in C0 of x is of this form. Uh, how how can you see this? Uh, this should just be if well, it's, this is like an algebraic geometry. So if you have an ideal, then we naturally get a closed set by looking at all the functions uh, by looking at all the functions in that ideal which which vanish at any by looking at all the points such that every function in the ideal vanishes there, right? So if we have i is in c of c naught of x an ideal, then we set f to be the set of x and x, such that f of x is equal to zero for all f and i. So this is certainly a closed set, and the ideal corresponding to that closed set is certainly contained in i. The only question is why is it equal to i? And the way to realize to, to do that is uh, it's going to be some stone Weierstrass uh, theorem uh, because you're going to separate points and uh, the complement of this set. You'll separate points, uh, just being an ideal. Okay. Uh, and then you can apply stone Weierstrass. All right, so every ideal is in fact this. So ideals correspond or bijection with the set of closed. Uh, Subsets. Right. Any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, for which? For the, for the the norm with that. Uh, yeah, probably I should have done this a bit more careful. Thank you. Um, because here we have two limits. Uh, yeah, let me let me clean this up a little bit. So this is certainly equal to this. That's fine. Uh, and this then is equal to this. That's fine by just first doing one minus a lambda on the right, and then one minus we use c star identity, and then do the one minus a lambdas on either side. And then this, oh no, here actually it was fine before. This is equal to this, so this is equal to this, this is equal to this, that's all fine. Uh, but now use the fact that one minus a beta uh, is a contraction. So let's just, this should be a lambda here. So I'll just pull that out on the left, right? So then this is certainly less than or equal to uh, the limit as lambda goes to infinity. Maybe I need to write lim soup there. And now we have here x star and then x minus x a lambda. All right, by using this, I can go this inequality. And now this, now there's just one a lambda, so this is equal to this. So we show that this is less than or equal to this, but again, the other way around is easy. All right, thanks. That looks a bit nicer. Uh, okay, so. So ideals correspond to closed sets. 
we talked about that. Um, so now the next thing I want to do is I want to talk about, so this was our brief excursion into approximate units. So now I want to talk about states. So what is a state? Uh, a state, well, let me first define a linear function, a linear function. So a linear functional on a C star algebra is Hermitian if call it phi if phi of x star is equal to phi of x bar and we'll say that it's positive if phi of y star y is always greater than or equal to zero so if it takes the positive cone into the non-negative real numbers, then we'll say that the linear functional is positive. Uh, again, for C star algebra, the zero linear functional is, is positive. Um, and uh, so no positive implies Hermitian, right? So positive implies Hermitian. Indeed, if you have, um, if x is self-adjoint, uh, so then we know in a C star algebra we can write x as its positive part minus its negative part. We've seen this before. And then if phi is positive, we have that it takes this to positives, this to positive, so its difference is a real number. So you get the therefore phi of x. So it at least takes self-adjoint things to the reals. But once you know that it takes self-adjoint things to the reals, so in general we have phi of y, you break it up into its real and imaginary parts. So this is phi of uh, y1 plus i y2, where the yi's are self-adjoint. And then we can write this as phi of y1 plus i phi of y2. Uh, and of course then the Adjoint will exactly put a minus here, and so you see that it preserves adjoint. All right, so positive implies Hermitian. Uh, what is a state? Uh, phi is a state. If phi is positive and norm one. Uh, so why do we take this definition? For a state, what should we think states are? Well, going along with our thinking that C star algebra is non commutative topology, let's think of what happens in the commutative setting. So, note if A is C naught of X, then we have the Reese representation theorem, which says that every positive linear functional corresponds to a positive measure on the space. All right, so in this case states, uh, what does it mean for a positive measure to have norm one? Well, by Reese representation theorem, that just says it's a probability. It gives measure one to the whole state. So states uh, correspond, in this case, are in one-to-one -one correspondence by the Reese representation theorem to probability measures uh, on the locally compact house door space X. So we should think of states as non-commutative uh, probability spaces. Um, all right, uh, so we'll study, yeah, maybe we'll just one quick remark. So as a remark is that, uh, so the state space, the state space, say S of A, is a compact, a weak star compact subset of the dual space. So it's certainly in, uh, so it's certainly a 
closed subset of the dual space because preserving probability will pass to limits in the weak star topology. Uh, and on the other hand, they all have norm one, so it's in the unit ball. So by banach glue we have that the state space is weak star compact. And this, so this is a general fact from you know, usual topology, the probability spaces are naturally a weak star compact, and this is true even in the non-community.